hear you great and see the PowerPoint too. Perfect. All right, so then let me get started by first thanking Scott for his invitation and Aniko as well for her invitation and Chantel Genoveva Arraiz, who worked very hard with the paperwork of, of making me uh, come to your colloquium and the whole Department of Linguistics at uh, the University of Utah. I wish we could be in person right now, but at, at least we are virtually connected for, for this afternoon. And I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, thanks to the wonders of technology, you are listening to me standing on the lands of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. And I am giving this talk standing on the land that belongs to the Nacochtcan people or Anacostans who are the native Algonquian people who lived in this area of Washington, D.C. during the 17th century. Their descendants are the Piscataway, and they live today in Prince George's County in Maryland. May we all protect and honor the history, the peoples, and the languages of these places. And let me start by explaining how social justice knocked on my door uh, and also, I believe, on the door of the whole field of second language acquisition. Uh, languages, uh, language learning can be studied from many disciplinary perspectives. One of them, and only one of them, is second language acquisition. Um, the field investigates uh, phenomena of language learning, focusing on when a new language is learned formally or informally, outside primary socialization in the family. Uh, there is a big focus on, on the late timing of the learning um, because most of our studies typically deal with uh, language learning during young, middle or, or older adulthood. There is also a, an, an amazing amount of life context that we investigate. So people learn new languages in school, at work, through friendships and intimate relations through tourism, for international study in the digital wilds. And we also have um, the circumstance of language learning uh, being forced or elected depending on different people. So due to colonization, immigration and persecution, many people do learn new languages and others learn it for personal enrichment or economic benefits and other reasons. Uh, there has been a lot of turns in the field of second language acquisition. In the 80s, we had a cognitive turn. In the 90s, we had a social turn. And now I, I believe we have a multilingual turn that is coming very slowly, but very surely. And um, I think I started calling it the multilingual turn in, at AAAL in 2010 in Atlanta in a plenary that I did then. Um, I also published a, a, an article in language learning about it, a book chapter in a very good book by Stephen May, and also a book chapter in the Handbook for, of Linguistic Multicompetence by Vivian Cook and Lee Wei. You see the dates. I've been thinking about these for a long time now. Uh, my textbook in second language acquisition, which was published originally in 2009, and I'm still working on the revised edition, but it will come out soon, is in my mind, a sort of revisionist uh, history and uh, synthesis of second language acquisition in the field. And uh, a couple of years ago, I published the Cambridge Handbook of Bilingualism with my very good friend and colleague, Anik de Hauer, and we just called it bilingualism uh, and we included both child bilingualism and adult uh, second language acquisition. But we, we, on purpose, we really just wanted to subsume everything under the label of bilingualism. Very, very proud of, of this handbook. Uh, my own idea of second language acquisition, of second language learning and multilingualism or bilingualism is that it's grading, fuzzy and probabilistic as a phenomenon, that it comes in many shapes and grades, and currently we're studying only a tiny slice of it. Uh, that multilingual language competencies and practices are irreducible to dichotomies. 
Bilingualism, multilingualism and language learning are profoundly inequitable. And so I've always been interested in very broad notions of ethics in SLA research. Uh, so already in 2005, um, I wrote a paper on reflecting on for what and for whom is our research. But after 2016, especially, I began to think whether discussing ethics was just enough. Uh, if you remember 2016, that was the year of the British referendum, the, the so-called Brexit. And I was in Europe when that happened, I was shocked by it. Then in November, we had the president, presidential elections and Donald Trump became the 45th president of the United States. So reflecting on who I was and what I was thinking and worrying about in 2016, I was really uh, conflicted by the awareness that the world was becoming more and more dangerous for multilinguals. Conflict and war, non-solidarity, anti-diversity, authoritarianism and widening poverty gaps were very evident in 2016. Um, and in language learning, to me, it started to become really, really evident that inequities manifest themselves in whose multilingualism is accepted and praised, whose multilingualism is viewed as a problem, and whose multilingualism remains invisible. So that's when I started to say, well, maybe what we need now after the cognitive turn, the social turn, the multilingual turn, maybe now it's the time when we are starting to see that we need a social turn in SLA. Social justice, is that a new disciplinary imperative of the field? My understanding of social justice is quite simple. Uh, it's the goal to decrease human suffering and to promote human values of equity and dignity. And we can connect these to language learning. I started writing um, other pieces where social justice became a main focus. And in 2019 and then in 2020, I also published two long pieces, as I tend to do, um, on the study of equitable multilingualism. And uh, the studies also uh, in one of the articles specifically focusing on the study of heritage language development and social justice. But then 2020 came and I was completely thrown off by the salience of racial, economic and epistemic injustice. It has always been there in our world, of course, but it was just such a, an undeniable reality starting uh, with the times of the pandemic. And so if we think of what the pursuit of the field of second language acquisition has been for more than 50 years, the big question driving all the research really has been how is L2 acquisition different and more difficult than monolingual child acquisition? And I started just thinking that it's about time that we may be asking a very different question. How can SLA promote equitable multilingualism as a societal value for all, and in the process, achieve a better understanding of the human capacity for language? The global pandemic uh, has been really disproportionately affecting historically oppressed groups, and many of them are multilinguals or multidialectal. Uh, for them, not only language, but also ethnicity and race are added sources of stress and strength, vulnerability and resilience during this pandemic that doesn't seem to end. Even anti-racism, I started to think, do we need to incorporate it into our SLA research? Um, <clears throat> the assumption that race matters in our research I think even the enormous evidence that it matters everywhere in the world for everything that we do in the world and the, in the United States, I think that by now the onus should be on demonstrating that it doesn't matter if a researcher thinks that it doesn't matter. So it seems like at this juncture, we are in a new place uh, where we may be 
wanting to think of a new SLA of the 20th and 21st century that supports um, equitable multilingualism as one of the main goals. So we have on the one hand, traditional ways of doing uh, SLA, sociocognitive, uh, sociocognitivist, post-positivist, functionalist, quantitative, experimental kinds of research. And now I just am very interested in thinking what's viable in the discipline and the research community of SLA in terms of addressing this idea of equitable multilingualism. Um, <clears throat> and I think that there are four things in the canon of SLA that researchers and especially new generations of researchers must unlearn. And I will talk about each of them in my presentation. One is the monolingual bias. We need to move away from it and we need to start knowing how to research while thinking that bilingualism or multilingualism is the default of the human language capacity. The second canon that we must unlearn is the deficit framings, especially of a late timing, but of any, any kind of uh, language learning that happens within the SLA framework. And so we should move away from it and towards um, a, a view of adult bilingualism as successful. The third canon we must unlearn is linguistic insecurity. Instead of promoting linguistic insecurity inadvertently, probably in our studies, we need to start to move into uh, ways of looking at multilingualism in adults and language learning that is free from native speakerism. And finally, the blindness to system, systemic inequities and racism that we have for very long uh, had in our research is another thing that we need to unlearn so that we can address equitable multilingualism in our studies. <clears throat> so let me talk first about the monolingual bias and why we need to move towards bilingualism, multilingualism as, as the default of the human language capacity. I have to say, I'm not at all the first person or the only person uh, saying these things. Um, we have very important research for a very long time saying that bilinguals can never be two monolinguals in one. And in the center of the three photos, you have Vivian Cook, who sadly passed earlier this year. These have been real champions of the multilingual turn. Um, so I don't want to get credit or give credit to myself for something that these three scholars have initiated and championed for many years. Think about it. The world is and has always been multilingual and bilingual. And if you count the number of official countries that we have and the number of languages that are documented, it's it's obvious uh, from the math that the, the world is tremendously multilingual. And still the normative ideal of a native speaker remains the unquestioned golden benchmark in SLA research. This frustrates me tremendously because I can't believe for how long we sort of have known this and yet for how long we keep doing the research with the uh, native speaker as the benchmark. Um, we're always thinking of the native speaker, but actually the definition, if you think deep down, is a monolingual who is owner of a single language by birthrights. This is what we mean by a, a native speaker, a monolingual speaker. And so we set up comparisons that are impossible in our research because they are subordinating comparisons. We compare first language acquisition by children to second language acquisition by adults. <clears throat> but it so happens that the first language acquisition by children is of an early timing and the timing of adults is late. So there is no constant comparison there. And then we compare monolingual children growing up with one language only to the acquisition of an additional language by adults. Again, there is no comparison there. So when both the timing and the number of languages vary in the comparison, there's nothing uh, that we keep constant in order for the comparison to make sense. 
And when we make these kinds of comparisons, it's also very clear to me that we are comparing apples and oranges. The single language competencies um, that developed during early childhood and the multi-language competencies that develop later in life. And in this comparison, the oranges always lose. So how do we unlearn this canon? How do we step out of the straight jacket of, of uh, having monolingualism at the reference point and treating bilinguals as two monolinguals in one? Let me ask you, do you feel, do you think, do you self-identify as bilinguals? How many of you, if I asked you to raise your hands? Uh, for me, the definition of bilingual or multilingual is complex and it's fuzzy and gradient, just like the, the definition of a monolingual or a bilingual. And so what I consider a bilingual or multilingual um, person is someone who can have competencies in the languages that they speak, not necessarily from birth, those are bilinguals too, not native-like or not even passing for a native speaker, not even perfectly equal proficiency in both languages or in the many languages that we may have. Simply a multilingual or bilingual person is someone who is functionally able to use more than one language for one's own purposes in life. And the purposes, of course, can vary from person to person. So students of language, are by definition emerging budding bilinguals and multilinguals, and we should treat them as such. So what I think is the, the move forward, the strategy out of the problem is to view and study multi, multilingual acquisition as the human default. The more bilingual experience, the more people can do and know um, in, in, with their languages. So bilingualism is, no, is not less, it's more. And at the same time, I'm always very cautious to say that I don't want to romanticize bilingualism. It's just a, factor, uh, a fact of life for most people on the planet Earth. So not demonizing it, but also not romanticizing it. Bilingual exposure is maximally rich. Notice that if we are bilingual and multilingual, we have a larger distribution of language sounds. We have more lexical entries for the same items and concepts. We have greater socially meaningful variability in the language that we use. It's always more, never less. Think about it also if we compare monolingual acquisition to bilingual and multilingual acquisition. It's a bit of a, a strategic essentialist comparison, but think about it. Monolingual acquisition does not give us the richest type of data on language acquisition because exposure to the one language is maximal and variability in how we acquire and what we acquire is flattened out. With bilingual multilingual acquisition, on the other hand, exposure can vary maximally to each of the languages. And this way we can actually collect maximally relevant evidence for human language acquisition. So bilingualism, multilingualism, and the data it produces is actually a fertile ground for cracking the language, the human language um, uh, capacity, because it's the kind of ground that gives us the most relevant evidence about the role of experience of language in language acquisition. Just a metaphor to, to put a final touch on these. Think of climatology and what kind of a theory of climate would we end up with if we based it on weather data from Hawaii only, where I lived for many years. Uh, the hottest months in August, it is in fact, the average is about 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And the coldest months in January, the average is 73 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Such a narrow range. So what kind of a theory of climatology 
would we end up with it? We definitely want much more varied and extreme data. Let me move on to the deficit framings of especially a late timing and how we need to be thinking instead of adult bilingualism as successful. Is the project of learning a language at a later age doomed to failure? It's really this deficit framing that I think we must unlearn. Researchers together with the public often believe that younger is better and older is too old. So we see a baby and we think great prospects for language learning. A young child still probably will do well. An adult already in trouble. An elderly completely out of uh, the scope of what they can do. How do we move forward away from that? Well, this is a very easy fix. If we listen to the last 10, 10 years of research, we would be able to move forward. Um, taking the extreme of thinking that too old to learn a language is a reality for people. Um, a study by Kozar and Yates in 2019, which I love, looked into 24 immigrants to Australia from 11 different countries and many first languages. All were between the ages of 40 and 73 when they had immigrated to Australia. And they had been residing in Australia for two to 14 years at the beginning of the study. And then the researchers uh, followed them for five years and they wanted to know who made good progress in five years and what might explain degrees of success. They found that all the participants who did the best in the five years and progressed the most had arrived with very good education levels from their own countries. They had had at least 12 years of education in their own countries. They also had arrived with better English to start with because they, they had studied it to some extent back in their countries before immigration. They were all proactive and self-directed language uh, learners, and they reported lots of good study strategies. And finally, none of these uh, people who progressed the most during the five years made comments about their old age or their deteriorating memory as being a hindrance to their efforts at learning English. All four conditions had to be met in these, um, in these best, fastest, older learners. But notice that two of them come from what they were bringing with them. And these actually, these two factors have been very well uh, studied and um, validated in other very large scale studies of immigrants outside the field of SLA. So in the end, what we see is that in immigration forced language learning at an older age, the rich get richer. But we also see that learning a new language is not a deterministic matter of age. It can happen at any age. And it may never be too late for many older people if the appropriate supports are available. What about the other extreme, the younger, the better myth? And as I say, it's not just lay people who believe in it, but many researchers as well. Well, the research tells us that for children who are learning a new language in foreign language situations, later is faster initially and no better or worse than earlier by the end of high school. We have the studies, uh, by now it's an amazing collection in different countries, in different uh, education systems, with slightly different starting ages being compared within the educational system. By the end of high school, when people finish high school, the earlier starters and the later starters basically have no difference in attainment. Very many teachers and owners of language schools in foreign language contexts are very shocked by this finding when I present it to them. Why would this be? Well, it just means that lowering the starting age won't produce better outcomes by the end of high school because other factors other than age trump the starting age of the students. 
uh, factors that are relatively well researched, some of them, like, like the intensity of instruction, the time on task, or the proficiency of the teachers who are teaching the foreign language, or the curricular continuity in a given educational system, because it's a lot of years from pre-K all the way to the end of high school. And also the motivation ebbs and flows of students, uh, the many turning points over those, whatever, 16 years of education in a foreign language, where boredom, disconnection of the curriculum, pressure of peers can enter into their language learning experiences. So these and other best and most recent findings about timings for learning a new language get more often than not dismissed in the SLA canon. Why is this? I think we should be checking out uh, most current age-related findings before we assume inherent deficits in late timings or deterministic superiority in young timings for language learning. <clears throat> Let me move on to the linguistic insecurity problem and <clears throat> the need to get free from native speakerism. It seems that many SLA researchers do not see these in the studies or in the world, but linguistic insecurity is actually rampant among many multilinguals. Here's a quote by Grosjean that I always uh, like reading in my presentations. Many bilinguals have a tendency to evaluate their language competencies as inadequate. Some criticize their mastery of language skills. Others strive their hardest to reach monolingual norms. Others still hide their knowledge of their weaker language. And most simply do not perceive themselves as being bilingual, even though they use two or more languages regularly. How, where does this linguistic insecurity come from? I think it comes from essentialist ontologies of language language that is ima imagined as self-contained and explained by the grammar books, the best dictionaries and the best corpora. Uh, with a complete finish line, we can learn everything of the language at the finish line, and that's what native speakers do. And also uh, a, a belief in the educated standard um, as being the goal of learning and the educated standard is really whatever language practices uh, the, the educated elites of uh, a place, the imagined monolingual elites uh, do, what, how they speak. So learning a language when it's construed as a ladder to educated monolingual native speaker perfection leads to linguistic insecurity. One thing that needs to be worked out in the empirical research in SLA is what other new notions of linguistic success we can have. Um, if we take away the native speaker as the benchmark and the golden comparison, then what else can we use? And actually we can use many things. And some studies, very few have begun to use mature experienced users as the baseline comparison but not monolinguality or nativeness as a requirement in those baselines. So a very nice example, but very rare, is a study by Saito and Hanzawa in 2016. They were studying accent, accentedness, and they decided that their main group was 56 Japanese freshmen without any immersive experiences. So they were studying English in Japan and had never been abroad. They compared how they learned and evolved in their accentedness by comparison to a baseline of 10 late experienced Japanese users who they considered to represent the point of ultimate attainment. Why? Because they had arrived in Vancouver after age 18, so very comparable to the age of their freshman uh, Japanese students in Japan. They had resided for 20 years or longer in Vancouver or in Canada, and they reported very frequent use of English, 5.7 out of six at home and work. So they were at the ultimate uh, attainment point. Whatever they were going to be doing with English, they had already done. And that was sort of like an ideal comparison 
for the freshmen. We also can focus on language development. And here, Diane Larson Freeman has been wonderful advocating against teleology, against theoretical ceilings to language development. And she has a paper that I really, really like with the title, There is no state and there is no end when it comes to language learning. In usage-based approaches uh, to linguistics, to language, and to multilingualism, we know that grammar is not an out there system and that it's inseparable from the users and the usage events. Meaning is embodied, frequency is in the statistical patterns um, in the input that we then abstract from, and with meaning and frequency together, that's how grammar emerges. So under this theoretical view, we should be checking our facts about the experience of language that learners and participants in studies have before we assume inherent deficits or unwillingness to learn in people. We have theories that can really help us move forward with empirical research from this uh, theoretical perspective, usage based second language acquisition, conversation analysis for second language acquisition, Vygotskyan second language acquisition. These are all theories that I think would endorse this view of language as grounded in experience. And finally, let me talk about the invisibility of systemic inequities and racism in the SLA research, which really impedes us, it prevents us from being able to address equitable multilingualism in our studies. I think we would all agree and recognize that all bilinguals and multilinguals frequently experience vulnerability. They're being positioned very frequently by others as a novice, a foreigner, an outside member, a not capable speaker. They're being told that their language is not good enough or not good enough yet. Here's an example from unpublished data from long, long ago, a master's uh, graduate student in the US saying, I did not think I was weak in my grammar, but when I got comments from a lot of professors about my grammar, I still feel I'm not a legitimate academic writer. Their comment make me think, make me to think I'm not academically appropriate, but still need to go to ESL English classes to fix my grammar. I feel often I'm a long-term patient in a hospital to get a 10-year-long surgery. This is so loaded with negative emotions and with linguistic insecurity. But while all of us could feel like this about our different languages at different points in our life or with different kinds of people who judge us or interlocutors, there are systemic structural forces stacking the deck against certain groups more than others. Some multilinguals will be at risk of experiencing their multilingualism as a curse rather than a fact of life all along while other multilinguals are able to experience it as a romanticized and commodified gift that adds to their privilege. There are very complex, difficult relationships between language learning and globalization, immigration, conflict, poverty, colonialism, white supremacy. And this can lead to more harmonious or more conflictive types of bilingualism. We are all ridden with privilege and vulnerability. And these are matters of degree. These are not fixed or inherent in any of us, but they all affect language learning. Let's face it, is it ever just about language? It surely is about language, but it's also about race and ethnicity, class, occupation and wealth, religion, gender, disability or ability, age, sexual orientations, gender identities. These are the isms in each society or in each community, and they vary from context to context, but many of these forces are systemic and at work. When I say these, oftentimes then I get reactions from colleagues and from students uh, doing SLA who tell me, yes, yes, we know all of these, but 
do these isms have to do with the actual linguistic development and attainment that we're interested in? And my answer is yes. I see it clearly, and sometimes I, I succeed in convincing and opening up the same view and vision for others, but other times it's not something that other people can see. But there are examples in the empirical research. And for example, this book on study abroad using um, qualitative uh, uh, methods and the lens of multilingualism contains several chapters that very clearly show that the isms do matter directly in what is learned and how it's learned. And let me give you an example from one of the chapters, Lucien Brown has a study of an Elto Korean learner he calls Grace. Grace is a 20 year old Caucasian American spending six months of study abroad in Seoul. She's proficient in Korean and highly motivated. She has had three years of Korean plus she has extensive interactions with Korean American Americans because she has a boyfriend and she attends Korean church regularly. She arrived in Seoul to do a 150 hour intensive course and she was determined to speak in Korean only with monolingual speakers of Korean. A perfect study abroad learner with the perfect motivation. But here are some of the things that the researcher uncovered in, in his longitudinal qualitative study. Grace speaks in Korean, but locals hear her in English. So when attempting to alert an employee at a cafe that the cafe's dog was trying to escape, Grace's Korean utterance was met with, oh no, sorry, I don't speak any English by the owner of the, or the employee at the cafe. So she said it in Korean, the person said, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't speak English. She also had experiences where other peers who looked Korean, but were less proficient than she was, were addressed in Korean, while she was assumed not to be proficient and was addressed in English. So in this story, she says, I was eating out with my friend Chloe, who is a Korean heritage learner from the same US university, at a Japanese style cuisine restaurant in the Wangshimni station. After Chloe ordered her item, the waiter turned to me and asked in English what I would like to order. And Chloe started laughing and said that I can also speak Korean too. So I ordered my meal in Korean while the waiter kept affirming that I wanted back into in what I wanted back into English by reading the English translations on the menu while I would affirm my order back in Korean which didn't happen with Chloe when she ordered her item. So a total fight with the, uh, with the um, uh, waiter who insists you must have to be ordering in English because you look like you speak English. And uh, she responding back in Korean with the order and again being denied the ability to speak Korean. And finally, in other, on other occasions, she uh, noticed that others simply made their English learning desires prevail and ignore her Korean learning identity and goals. So here she was explaining to the researcher, even though I would speak in Korean with this person, an acquaintance at a party, he would consistently reply to me in English. I asked him why he replies in English despite me using Korean, and his reply was that it was because he is learning English. I replied that I am also learning Korean. I also asked if it was an issue with my Korean and he said that he was surprised that I could speak my, any Korean at all. I asked if it would be more comfortable to just speak in Korean, but he said he prefers English when talking with me. So what's happening in this study? Uh, Grace is a Caucasian English speaking foreigner. That's what the interlocutors can see. Um, the interlocutors are also thinking this national ideology that Korean is very difficult for foreigners. And they're also thinking English is a world important language, the English fever that many Koreans are reported to have. So what we have is uh, raciolinguistic and language ideologies of the locals complicating greatly 
uh, the access to Korean that Grace can have. Um, to, to bring it to a different kind of population, Seymour and Yorn reports on Mahmoud, a Palestinian American heritage language student taking Arabic in Milwaukee. And he remembered with embarrassment an incident while visiting his family in Palestine. He said um, <clears throat> his cousins took him to lunch and he was handed a menu and asked to order from it, but he could not read it because it was in Arabic. He commented that since he looks exactly like his cousins, people assume he knows Arabic and he was very embarrassed when he could not read the menu. This incident actually was his reason for enrolling in modern standard Arabic courses at the university. And so he literally says to the researcher, it is just too hard to look Arab and not have Arabic proficiency. And on the opposite spectrum, Samimi with Mark, a white American who had lived in Michigan, Florida and the Midwest and was very, very good at Arabic. He tells the researcher that he receives huge compliments when Arabs uh, uh, listen to him in Arabic, but then they, he says, Arabs will stare at me confused, simply stare and then say, this just doesn't add up. I see your face and features, but your tongue is Arabic. And at the same time, he also says that he, he feels oftentimes these are backhanded compliments when the native speakers tell him, oh my God, how can you speak so well? Look at him and how he can speak better than we can. And Mark thinks that what they really mean is, you will never know the language, it is ours. You are the other, an outsider, and your hair and eye color will always give you away. So who is a legitimate speaker of a language? Well, someone who not only sounds it, but also looks it. Others talk to us depending on how we sound and how we look. The isms are inescapable, and whatever L2 we learn, it is shaped by those isms. And this is really theorized in the, in the concept of racial linguistics in language education that uh, Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa have explained really well in the past. Uh, the same ways of using language can receive different evaluations based on who the speakers are. The linguistic practices of speakers with more privilege are more positively evaluated, and those of speakers with less privilege are more negatively evaluated. And this is regardless of the objective practices and of the competence or the appropriateness with which they use language. There are systemic structural forces at plain language learning, and they stack the deck against already multiply marginalized groups. So we need to address these and by addressing social selectivity of the research, I think we can do this a little bit. Um, what do L2 learners look like typically in SLA studies? They are majority school day children, they are children in immersion, they are EFL college educated young adults, international students, and college educated children of immigrants have begun to make it into SLA studies in the, in the category of heritage speakers. But these are mostly pastoral contexts and populations. And we are seeing an expansion of these by people like Aline Gottfreud and Sible Andriga, Andringa, who are now engaged in a project uh, called SLA for All, reproducing SLA research in non-academic samples. But my concern is that it's not just non-academic samples. We need to be studying grassroots folk circumstantial multilinguals. Uh, those people who are learning languages not by election, but by force. And the more grassroots language learning we study, the more hostile the experiences of these learners uh, can be expected to be, and thus also the more unstructured, because many of them will, won't even have a lot of instruction. And this results really in very messy competencies in what I call gradient competencies, and we just don't study them in the studies. 
But if we want to understand the human capacity for language, we can't just uh, study a thin slice of what language learning means in the world. So I do hope that grassroots multilinguals will be included a lot more in SLA studies, because that's the way we can start doing empirical work that addresses inequity head on. And the factors to be investigating, investigated would be a lot of the factors that we all know and that we all appreciate in SLA, but what's still missing from this literature? Well, the marginalized multilinguals, including ethnicity and race as a factor, including literacy and wealth as a factor, including colonization and migration as a factor in language learning from an SLA viewpoint. The challenge though, is to do this without essentializing, without decontextualizing, um, because everything in all these factors is variably changing across time and space. It's always dynamic in the here and now, and it's certainly very paradoxical, complex, and open-ended. We have theories and SLA researchers can study those theories to begin to grapple with how to do this empirically. Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality theory is very important. It says that race intersects with all other social identities and their associated isms, and that intersectionality is crucial for understanding systems of oppression. And so all the isms that we should be studying in relationship to language learning can be illuminated by the idea of intersectionality. And we should be looking at what the consequences are for language learning, looking into identity agency ideology and power, knowing that they matter. And then as SLA researchers, we can look empirically at how it matters. So to conclude, um, let me just finish with the words of a 17-year-old Mexican-American uh, young woman called Carmen in the study by Borrero, who likes being bilingual in the United States. So this is an optimistic touch to end. She says, uh, like my Spanish is getting a little bit bad, but I still try to have it. I still speak Spanish. Sometimes I speak Spanglish. It's just like when I don't know a Spanish word, I'll say it in English, and if I don't know it in English, I'll say it in Spanish. It's just like, uh, like an everyday thing. I think it's something that I'm going to use like every day. Yeah, I use it, I translate for my mom and my grandma, and just here in school too. I like being bilingual. Very optimistic uh, comment. But the thing is, Carmen's idea of bilingualism is very different from research-based constructions of language, bilingualism, and success that are still dominant in SLA research. I'll just say, we do think and trust our context-free views of language learning. We do think that it's just about learning language. We do address uh, things like bilingualism and nativeness as if they were dichotomous. We do still include a finish line in our studies and we act in our studies, in the designs, in the data collection, in the interpretation of the data, as if everyone's uh, bilingualism and language learning was equitably supported and equally valued. And as if the racism and the other isms were just irrelevant for language learning. So my question is for colleagues, for students for the, the future generations of SLA researchers. Are you ready, are we ready for a new SLA of the 21st century in support of equitable multilingualism? And I hope that we are beginning to be. And after the social turn, the multilingual turn, let's have a social justice turn and let's try to study equitable multilingualism and ways of fighting off systemic racism and oppression in language learning. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Lourdes. That was, that was wonderful, very engaging and compelling. Um, and if we were meeting in person, you would hear a roar of applause right now. <laughs> really appreciate that.
So we'll turn the time over to uh, the audience for questions now. And, and Lourdes, if you feel comfortable, you could perhaps field those questions yourself. And then um, sure. Aniko, who is hosting this, this session, will then let us know when we need to, to end the questions and discussion and go to the student session. Okay, I, anyone, does anyone have any questions or comments? Oh, Joanna has a hand up. So um, you asked the question, are we ready? Can I turn it around and ask you, what do you think? I know oh. what my answer is, but I was wondering. <laughs> um, I, think, I think there is a, a slow readiness coming about in the new generations. I think, I think there is interest. Um, in being getting more ready to include social justice in our empirical approach to language learning. But I have to also say that it's, it's often uh, an uphill battle that I feel. Uh, I'm lucky that my colleagues and, and my friends and my students never really uh, reject these ideas out flat. They're very kind and they're willing to let me present them and, and put out these messages, but oftentimes the reactions in the end are, this is too impractical, or this is too far-fetched, or how are we going to do these studies? We can't do everything. And then I feel like, first of all, when you feel that you have to do something, that's the first step, not, not being able to deny anymore that you have to do something. And then good researchers have never designed their studies or addressed research questions just so that they could do it the way we know how to do it. So people take, take risks, researchers take risks and, and try to look for new ways of doing things when they're convinced they want to address something. So I'm hoping that it is this, this confluence of really wanting to do it, therefore let's do empirical work to take little steps to understand how we can do these in practice in the studies. Some people are, are beginning to do that and others are more reticent about it. Thank you so much. The main question, uh, the main uh, response is probably, so what, what does this have to do with language learning? But uh, many studies are turning up that show very clearly that it has a lot to do with language learning. Uh, Rachel, <laughs> sorry, if you if you put up your hand, I think the the image in Zoom puts you up, and then I can see you, uh, Rachel. Hi there, thank you so much. That was just fantastic. Um, so you end with uh, you end by talking about um, looking to the future, right? With this challenge that uh, Johanna just um, referred to as well. Um, I'm looking at a Zoom room that is large and filled with the future of our field, right? There, there are so many students present um, who have just heard all of your messages. And I guess what I'm wondering is, um, given that many students actually are the recipients of the oppression, right? They are among those who are oppressed. Um, what, what is your advice to, to students, um, to our emerging scholars, to our colleagues who are just, who are very early in their careers uh, with respect to um, how, how to build a career in this environment and, and given your vision uh, for the future? Yeah, that's a very good question. So oppression, all of us are oppressed, but some are much more oppressed than others. And uh, there's also a lot, of, a lot of internalization of deficits and att attributions by others. So it's hard, but that's exactly what we need to be fighting against, our own self-oppression and self-internalization of deficit. So I think 
it would be cruel to put all the responsibility on the on the very beginning careers and the students uh, who are starting. Um, I think it's their faculty who need to be modifying their curricula to include the right kinds of readings that can offer tools to think and to do empirical research in these ways. And um, I think sometimes we do have the research right there in front of us, but our selection of what we think needs to go into our syllabus is, is still blinded by the canons and the traditional ways of thinking. Uh, I was thinking of an example that I didn't include in the presentation, but I can bring up now. Uh, Scott's work with uh, the Miranda rights and the, the non-native speakers who don't understand at all the Miranda rights and then will suffer in the legal system because of that. One could say that study, which is methodologically super, super good, right? That study belongs to a forensic linguistic syllabus. That's it, right? So then if a student chooses to do forensic linguistics, they would be exposed to that. But if not, they will miss the study. They will not read it. That study can be in any class where we discuss proficiency, where we discuss um, language processing, right? So curricula, syllabi, classes that we traditionally feel like, no, they cannot include social things. They got, if our curricula begin to select studies with an eye on first, let me, these issues drive my selection, then choose and prickly really good studies and then make the connection for the students, then the students can get much better training to start fighting off their own self-internalized uh, issues and their oppression. So a, a big responsibility is with us. And risks, always, I always recommend to all my students, calculated risks are good, but crazy risks that jeopardize your career are not good, right? Uh, Ying. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Ortega. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk, which is very enlightening, informative, and also very thought-provoking. I really enjoyed it. Um, so regarding my question, um, so I totally agree with you that we should promote um, translanguaging and multilingual uh, pedagogy to promote equitable um, multilingualism and social justice. Like during your talk, I was thinking about the assessment aspect. Um, so, you know, like a lot of the tests are still using monolingual and native speaker norms, right, to assess language learners' performance. So I was wondering, could you please share your perspectives on maybe some of the ways that we could use to align multilingual and translanguaging pe uh, pedagogy with, um, you know, assessment in relation to uh, standardized tests and also assessment in research. Thank you so much. Yeah, assessment in research is easier because you can create your own assessments if you want in research as you can choose your baselines and argue for the validity of those baselines and, and assessments. In standard assessment, we all know that it's much more difficult. However, there is also a choice for people working with testing and assessment to uh, embrace more critical work. And we do have a lot of very good assessment and uh, uh, testing uh, language assessment and language testing people who are now creating real good work towards multilingual assessments and translanguaging in assessment. One of them is Jamie Schissel. She's been publishing a lot and doing a lot of work. We have other testers who do critical work like Tim McNamara has, has done for many, many years. And uh, I forget the names of um, other scholars, but there are many scholars. I, with age, I'm beginning to lose my ability to have the names <laughs> at the top of my tongue. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Kunan is another critical assessment person. And, uh, and uh, in world, the assessment of world language languages English or including world languages and English as an inter international language issues in the design of assessments um, is also an area of research now. So once again, 
um, if you're exposed to the literature and assessment and testing that maintains the status quo and is behind all the standardized assessment efforts that have been going on for years and years, then you won't be able to see anything else. But if you look, there's always critical work in almost every area of applied linguistics and, and language learning. Alana Shohami, very critical language assessment person, right? Could I ask a question, Professor Ortega? Leanne? Is yes. that Leanne? Oh. Yes. Yes, okay. yes. Um, I would turn on my camera, but I have a little child next to me who's making a lot of noise and <laughs> I don't want to be distracting. Um, I just wanted to um, thank you for such an interesting talk. It really made me think um, about myself as someone who speaks two languages on a daily basis and also as someone who has native English. Um, and so, as uh, Professor Jarvis said, I lived in Italy for a really long time, um, and I, my children, I remember speaking to them in English um, out in, in public spaces, and I have a, one of my very best friends is uh, Polish, um, but she lived in Italy as well, and so I would speak to my children in English to give them this, this advantage, right? And she would not speak to her son in Polish because of those um, social ideas that Polish was either inferior or was not as important as English. Um, and so I thought, I remember thinking, what a shame, what a shame, because what a beautiful gift um, to be able to give to your son. And she herself would say to me, well, it's just not, it's just not worth it. It's not, um, it's not English. If it were English, then I would do it. Um, so I wanted to ask you what you thought in terms of um, how to encourage even parents um, to give their children that gift of even a minority language or you know, a language that is not the majority or the, um, the regional even variety, um, the sober regional variety rather, um, right. just, just so that those languages wouldn't be lost. I mean, I know as, in terms of a, of a PhD, student, PhD student who studies second language acquisition, of course, we can, we can study it, we can research it, and I could write about it perhaps, but what, what could I tell my friend, um, Johanna? Yeah. Um, your, friend, uh, your friend's case is very common and widespread, and it goes back to the idea that the isms completely matter for language learning. It's not an individual choice of a parent, it's a structural issue. Your friend is trying to protect herself, her child and her family from discrimination because of speaking Polish, which in the context of Europe is seen as a lowly immigrant language, just like Spanish in the context of the US. And we have lots of studies of Spanish speakers in the US avoiding using Spanish in public spaces or being um, attacked physically or with words for using Spanish in public places. So I, I would always say that uh, in our efforts to support harmonious uh, bilingualism in the family, we have to be very careful not to um, blame the, the parents or make the parents responsible for the bilingual outcomes of their children because there are structural societal issues that are actually very real for the families and that motivate them to, to behave in, in certain ways. So probably for your friend, just to even be aware that it's not her fault and that it's her choice, yes, but it's a, cho a choice that is coerced by the societal view of Polish as a non-worthy language, which is unfair and unjust. And so being able to put the finger on what's unjust and unfair, even if we end up saying, but it's better for my child not to be seen as a Polish speaker in public spaces or, so even just putting the finger as a mother saying, okay, society is unjust and I'm doing something coerced by society is not entirely my own individual blame or responsibility, I think would be a good thing. And then finding other ways around to um, provide the child with the Polish that the child needs or else 
they won't speak the language growing up, right? And we know that very well from the literature. As I said in the presentation, this everything with uh, multilingual grassroots learning is so paradoxical and so complex. It's very difficult. It's like walking on ice, giving advice to parents, for example. My friend, Anik de Hauer, does this on a daily basis and I've learned a lot from her. Uh, harmonious bilingualism is what we need to protect, but it's not easily attained in our societies. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Professor Ortega. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne, for the question. If the faculty doesn't have or staff any other questions, I'd like to invite the students to stay to talk to Professor Ortega some more. So, and I want to, again, thank you for joining Scott and thank you for the wonderful talk. So, yeah, thank students, you so much. Thanks, Lourdes.